Let's see if I can do it. Yeah, yeah it's good. <laughs> yeah. It does look rather bizarre. I think that has to be in character since we're all creatives of some sort, right? That's a, that's the part. Evening Europe, my name is John Hedge, and I am delighted to be bringing you the Weekend with Good Friends panel, Cozy Horror. I hope that you have a nice blanket with you, you've made yourself some hot chocolate, I hope the lights are down and you are feeling ready to just get comfy with this lovely, small, private, comfy, furry panel that I have ready for you this evening. Uh, I'm going to just introduce them all, let them say a little bit about themselves, and we'll get to talking about the cosy. So shall we start with you, CJ? Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm CJ. Um, my father was Danish and my mother was English, so I have an unpronounceable name. And I'm not very interesting. And as I just remarked to John, I don't have anything to sell. But I am a big fan of the good friends of Jackson and Ice. 
and I um, do enjoy the podcast a great deal. And I really was very flattered to be asked along, considering what an uninteresting non-entity I actually am. So thank you very much for um, for listening to me tonight. And I must say, if you haven't heard any of the other panels, there were some fantastic panels yesterday, which until my girlfriend told me to stop interrupting and asking right. questions, I bombarded with questions. So <laughs> feel free to get your revenge today. Thank you. Fantastic. And Monty. Hi, uh, I'm Monty Lin. Uh, I am a freelance uh, TTRPG writer and editor. I've worked with uh, games such as Magpie Games on their Avatar Legends uh, Last Airbender RPG and with Angry Hamster Press's uh, Witch Faded Souls um, second edition RPG, a fantasy, urban fantasy horror RPG about selling your soul to a demon. Um, I'm also a short story, a speculative fiction short story writer, and I'm also managing ed editor of Uncanny Magazine, a uh, once every two month science fiction fantasy magazine. And their next issue actually is coming out this Tuesday, which you can find on uncannymagazine.com. Fantastic. And Sue? Hi, I'm Sue Savage, and I do a bit of freelance RPG writing. I've had a few scenarios published for the uh, urban fantasy game Liminal. Uh, you can find those on Drive Through RPG and the Liminal Casebook. And I also wrote a cozy mystery RPG called Matrons of Mystery. You can also find that on Drive Through RPG or on Lulu if you want it in print. And Brilliant. you can also find me on various internet places under the name of Savage Spiel. Savage Spiel. Brilliant. Thank you all very much. And let's start with the basics, because I personally am not entirely sure what cozy horror is. And my outcome for this panel is to quiz the three of you to try and figure out myself what it is. And I hope as I do so that the people following along, either live or at YouTube later, will know what it is by the end of this panel. So let's try and start with the broad strokes. Would any of you like to have a go at trying to define cozy horror for us? I know we have experts on this subject on the panel, so I'm going to offer to go first, because then when the experts talk, I won't look quite so ignorant. <laughs> I know that some of your friends have written books on cozy horror and you've done your own cozy horror role-playing games, so it's always good to go first. Years ago, I used to be a cultural studies lecturer. It was complete an accident, but it just happened. And so I worked at a British university where I taught cultural studies. And there we talked a lot about genre conventions. And cozy horror as a genre is an American coining, I believe, quite recent. And it means a small town mystery horror film, usually. But I understand that the coziness inherent in the genre, there's always a mystery involved, which is resolved at the end of the film. It's always in a small town, or usually in a small town. And there's various other convention rules for it. And as a convention, it means this very specific set of values. Why the coziness lies is it's a film you come in from work and you sit down and you think, oh, the fog is on. So you sit down and you watch the fog with your cup of hot chocolate. And that is, I understand, what Americans mean by the genre of cosy horror. I could be woefully out of date, because that's based on stuff from a few years ago. As a motif, cosy horror, to me, means something very different. It's when you take domesticity, you take the joyful aspects of life, you take um, aspects like weddings, or just to give an example, weddings are usually happy, joyful ex um, existences or another life change like moving into a student home together or just you know happy domestic cozy things that people usually have a warm feeling about and you subvert them and you usually subvert them not by anything initially horrific happening but just by having events play out in a way that is unexpected that's my definition of cozy horror as a trope or as a motif rather than as a genre. So I think the term means more than one thing. And I think whatever you think cozy horror is, it's right for you. And I think that that's how we have to take it for this, because otherwise we're going to disappear down some academic wormhole of genre conventions. And unless we're, re we're writing for TV tropes wiki, we're never going to get anywhere. 
So let's yeah. hack out something that works for us in the audience. But that is my uneducated, um, slightly befuddled, and very rundown um, guess as to what cosy horror means to me. I'm not sure you get to the uneducated when you're talking about the academic definition, but sure, let's go with that. Uh, keeping it sort of open then, without necessarily um, closing off any doors, do the other two of you want to have a wee shot at trying to define it? Sue, you look ready to go. I don't know if I am. I, I think CJ might have said everything that I was already thinking. Just, the, the game that I wrote was Cozy Mystery rather than Cozy Horror specifically. But, and yeah, Cozy Mystery is a very well-defined genre in the UK where there is a huge amount of TV shows. And so I think a lot of people my age and older grew up watching Midsummer Murders. And that, every episode of that mm. is set in some lovely English village in, in a... A never strictly defined place, but uh, I've always kind of seen it as the Cotswolds. It's full of uh, terribly nice people doing uh, rural things like having uh, village fates and uh, visiting model villages. And so I, I think there's a fair overlap between cosy mystery and cosy horror and that it is the intrusion of something as absolutely brutal as a murder into this very charming scene. Me. Uh, Monty, do you want to sum us up and give us another opinion there? Um, I can try. I'm, I'm, I'm just as befuddled by this, this category. Uh, I asked my writer friends and peers for a definition, and of course I got number of friends plus one different definitions um, <laughs> and, and equal amount of befuddlement. Um, from what I can tell, at least for personally, I feel like the, the cozy part is the thematic aspect of um, a, a short story or a, the game where focus is on um, um, the, the cozy, the cozy re, uh, resolutions that we kind of want in life, like um, found family or um, finding yourself after a bad breakup or um, discovering an aspect of your identity. But then it's the setting surrounding you is the horror, right? So the found family is a bunch of different kinds of monsters suddenly, you know, finding a, a click with amongst each other, or bad breakup is actually with, you know, um, Yog Sothoff, you know, that kind of thing. So um, that's the way I see it. Um, but again, like I said, now that I've had my own definition, that's number of friends plus two different definitions. Beautiful. Floating around in, in my head. So. See, I'm kind of wondering, uh, listening to all of this, because cozy is a very popular word right now. We're seeing more cozy games. Cozy is a word that is entering the zeitgeist. And um, I'm kind of almost interpreting it as not an adventure story, but with some more stuff on the side of it. Is that Does that ring a bell? Does that feel realistic? Is it almost a... It that reminds me of something my father told me. My father was an old Dane. He grew up in Denmark before the Second World War, and he came to England during the war to fight Hitler. And um, when we went back in the 90s, 2000s, we used to go back quite regularly, but we hadn't lived there since the 70s. And he got talking to his family, who kept talking about things being huggerly, huggerly, or hugger, or hooker. He would say hooker which I thought, you know, if your definition of coziness is hookers, then, you know, but it's it's hugger, hugger, huggery. It's a very, very strong notion in Denmark about coziness. And he said it meant very different things when we went back in the 90s and the 2000s to what it meant, and today, to what it meant when he was younger. When he was a child, the term hugger meant wearing your grandfather's socks because you didn't have any of your own or wearing your grandmother's cardigan to school because you were too poor to wear anything else so it had a kind of making do with what you had and not rising above your station kind of connotation the coziness was a kind of domesticity invested in the poor and it was, you know, we can't afford to go to the theatre or the opera or, you know, go out on a motorboat. But what we can do is we can have some nice candles and we can sit around the fire and we can all sit together while your grandfather tells you his stories about the War of 1868. 
and we all wish that we'd go and drown ourselves down the well. But that was the that was the notion of Hugger that he grew up with. And he said by the seventies it had been picked up by Copenhagen, Copenhagen marketing people and it had turned into a central plank of Danish culture that the question was almost a heresy. And now the notion had become we are Danish, we must be cosy. And he said, it's just the same in England as being middle class. It's like that notion of upper middle classness that every episode of Midsummer Murders is about. It's kind of that idealised, oh, look, you're white, you're upper middle class, you live in a beautiful Cotswold village. Oh, you do, don't you, Chris? Well, never mind. And, you know, and nothing bad ever happens to people like you, apart from maybe the Spaniel is sick. Uh, throws up something it ate or you know some some loud um, ruffian drove through the village at 30 miles an hour playing loud music out of the window and had a punk hairstyle he said that is roughly what hooker had become and he was very cynical about the whole idea so at the slightest when we went back in the um 2000s whenever any of the family got us together for a big family and talked meeting and there were all the candles and the food was brought out and they were going on about how ugly it was he would say oh, i hate this vomit vomit it is disgusting oh what a load of nonsense what utter crap oh i wish somebody would just you know ah, throw the whole table over or you know vomit on the table this is shit this is not what this is not authentic danishness this is just package but you know and he would rave about it. So cosy horror made me think of that. I'm sorry for the lengthy anecdote. Lengthy anecdotes are what I do, yeah. as though you know me know. But it struck me as kind of relevant that to him it was an almost offensive term. He said, this is why I went to England and gave up on all this and became a bricklayer and lived on an estate with you, my peasant son. You know, I repudiated these values and now they are thrusting them down my neck. So there you go. Angry old Danes, a speciality of mine. Mm. There's another point there as well. Coziness is invested in, often in heritage for the English. They have an archetypal notion of, you know, the stone circle, the hills, the countryside, the rose garden, the cottage, uh, the village church. But it's a very white Anglo-Saxon or even a white Celtic notion. It doesn't have a lot for immigrants like me, and it certainly doesn't deal with other people's experiences and their, and their communities, which may have very different values. So I think that's another thing we have to be wary of, is that cosy is often the commodification or the fossilization of an ideal. It's a myth. Mm -hmm. But myths are fun in games, and myths are great to play with in games, and that's why that makes it so much fun. I'll shut up now. I was just rambling. I was wondering, because the, the piece I was really picking out, and I'm hoping to pass this back to the three of you, is that idea of, is it something to do with, it feels like it could happen to you? Because yeah. it's almost the distinct opposite of cosmic horror, which feels almost unbelievable in some ways. Is there something there? Sue, you look like you have a response. Yeah, I was just thinking of some of the books that I've heard described as cosy horror, and that initially took me by surprise because these are books that scared the bejesus out of me. Uh, that's uh, uh, T. Kingfisher's horror novels, uh, The Twisted Ones, uh, The Hollow Places and A House with Good Bones. So I've heard them all described as cosy and I think they kind of fit more in with what Monty was saying now I've listened to that uh, because the, the premise behind all of them is that uh, uh, the, the lead character is on their own, they're going to stay in uh, the house of a, a parent or grandparent. And they're at a kind of a transition point in their life. Uh, I think with the, the last two I mentioned, I think in both cases, they've recently split up with their husband. And uh, yeah, in one case, she's moved in with, into her uncle's old museum. And in the other case, she's moved back in with her mum. Museum. Uh, yeah. It's uh, so. This is in America. It's one of those small town museums. Uh, again, wow. small towns. It's a taxidermy museum. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, and so it's all very well. Basically, nice to begin with. That uh, she makes friends with the guy in the coffee shop next door. Uh, she has a, a lovely time making a spreadsheet to start cataloguing the exhibits. And it, it's only after that that things start getting weird. 
So maybe this will let us transition quite nicely then into a discussion about some of the do's and don'ts and what the tropes are. So it seems that one of them is to do with these stories tend to be in small towns. They tend to start off nice. So this it has a bit of a Hallmark movie feel to it, I guess. The Christmas tree movies. Go on, Monty. You must have seen a Hallmark movie. I've never seen. I've never actually watched the whole one. I saw part of one where a girl was going back to her hometown, and it turned out that she'd grown up on a Christmas tree farm. Have you ever seen one of those? Um, I, do, I mean, I kind of see those as horror movies as opposed to <laughs> Christmas movies. Oh, there you go. Crazy horror. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You, the the small town is interesting. Uh, I don't know if I agree, but some of the examples I've read um, to research for this panel, some like take place in suburbs and small towns. Um, I think there's a very strong focus on normality or or what we would or Amer maybe americans would consider normality right like um there's a short story um the little witch by m rickard uh that i feel is very cozy horror because it takes place in a kind of a small suburb it's uh, a woman who is seeing this little girl who dresses as a witch appear in you know at halloween every year but doesn't seem to age mm -hmm. then as she tries to like form a relationship with this little girl. All these weird things start happening. Neighbors start dying mysteriously. But it has this tone of like, you know, small town, cute suburbia, American suburbia. Um, you know, despite the fact that like in between the lines, something horrible is happening. Um, I think that's a great example. If people want to read that, a short story. It's, Could we put that in the out, so. Could you put that in the notes? Because that is amazing. I'd love to read that. That sounds awesome. Uh, do I uh, the Discord channel? Throw it into the Discord channel, and I'll throw it into the YouTube. Thank you. Cool. Um, so, is it feeling of normality? So, like the the from the British side, we're getting this feeling of the upper middle class, which is this this aspirational thing that Brits are taught that that's what we're trying to get to and then in America it's the suburbs so again it's that that aspirational American dream you should have a house and a lawn and a picket fence is part of it leading into playing off those tropes and understandings of that very real world I guess that the hegemonic reality of the the notion in Gramsci no, that's too academic let's just go down the front basically yeah it's exactly that I think it is the motion of normality but i was thinking back to the edwardian ghost story and i think the best cozy horror stories from that there was a genre that developed wr jacobs the monkey's poor is that the one yeah. i can't remember which one it is but there's a whole number of different ghost stories from the edwardian periods which have one thing in common they're about a couple marrying and moving into a house together yeah and they're about them doing up the house and them making the house their own or staying in a cottage. Um, Man Size in Marble is an example. Um, another art example, interestingly, is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Is that a horror story? It's up to you. But that whole notion of couples forming a house together and living together and them resolving their experiences and them trying to deal with the strangeness that comes... But there's a lot of joy in those books. And I think that's what really, to me, denotes cosy horror. That there's a lot of joy in it, as well as the horror. But are we talking about that as a motif or a genre thing? I don't know. I don't know. Probably I've got the wrong idea of what we mean by cosy horror here. Sue? Yeah, so that's kind of just brought me back to cosy mysteries again. Is there one of my favourite cosy mystery TV shows is Rosemary and Time. And a big part of that show is the very close friendship between Rosemary and Laura, the two lead characters. So yeah. yeah their their job is constantly being interrupted by people getting murdered. That what it's all about is the the two of them uh meeting for the first time in a difficult situation, uh realizing they had something in common and uh beginning this wonderful friendship that runs throughout the whole series. My sister appeared in one of those cosy mystery things. I'm trying to remember what the show's called, but I never actually bothered to watch it. But it's about a slightly eccentric, middle-aged woman living in an English village solving mysteries. But what about Quincy or Murder, She Wrote? Is Murder, She Wrote a cosy horror? 
And so I can't answer that because I've never watched it. Really? Absolutely. Angela Lanbury was in, um, um, oh, what's it called? Hitchcock film, Gaslight. And she went on in later life to appear in hundreds of episodes. Have you, is that, you guys must have seen it, surely? Or have I gone completely mad into an alternate I, universe? I have seen a few, but I don't watch a lot of TV, so I can't uh, help you too much. Monty. So, oh. yeah, well, you yeah, must I have seen, seen yes. I have seen episodes. I, I, I would say it would be classified cozy or a uh, cozy mystery, but. Um... I'm not an expert on murder she wrote, so I don't know if I can give you a good definition. Okay, sorry. I'll just agree with you. How about I'll agree with you? <laughs> so we kind of—I feel like we're getting the, our head around setting. So for it to be, uh, for it to be a cozy horror, it has to be have some level of domesticity to it. It needs to have some story with some level of positives and a feeling of almost like safety being brought in the start. What else do I need to be able to write a cozy horror? What are the other big tropes that I do need to hit in order to be being called? Maybe let's expand a little bit. So horrifying, cozy mystery can probably be shoved into this as well. So, Sue, so why is your game a cozy mystery? What what parts of it do you make it feel like that's what it is? Is it a mystery? Well, yes, it is a mystery. and I based it on Brindlewood Bay, so it's using the same mystery system as that and so that also calls itself a cozy mystery and that is based on murder she wrote so i guess it must be cozy but yeah i think the, the primary thing about it uh, making it cozy is the characters that you're playing it uh, say like brindlewood bay they're all old women uh, they all have sort of old-fashioned names like uh, uh, doris uh, they, they've all no, got some kind of uh, hobby, like uh, knitting or bird watching, and so that is the, the the hobbies do generally, in some way, come into the mystery. Uh, so the last time I played it, I was playing a bird watcher, and who we reminisced about a time she was attacked by a golden eagle while jumping out of a helicopter to apprehend the criminal. <laughs> so I I think humour is actually a part of what makes something uh, cosy whether it's mystery or horror. That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> so so you the mill, like feel like you could meet them. And is is that how I should think about my characters? Run of the mill, like I could meet them in the street? Or should I be doing going further? Yeah, that's a that's a good point that I hadn't thought of. Yeah, the protagonists tend to be pretty ordinary people. So yeah, for the cozy mystery, it is typically just retired old ladies with fairly mundane hobbies. And yeah, T. Kingfisher books they are, I and mean, they they have interesting features because it's T. Kingfisher writing them. So one of them's an entomologist, and is doing this long project of cataloguing beetles. But. Uh, same time, she's got a slightly unusual job, but she's still a pretty ordinary person. Which I suppose is a fantastic setup for someone to get involved in and be the main character in a story, which is a little bit more mundane. Hey, uh, Monte, CJ, what do you think about characterization with cozy horror? What are what what kind of characters are we expecting to see in these tales? Go on, Monte, you go first because I'll. Um, yeah, again, again, um, the, the research I did and my research was mostly focused on short stories. Um, uh, one, you know, novels take a lot, a lot of time for, to read through. Um, but, and I wasn't able to tackle like role-playing games and such, but, um, I do feel like the protagonist, uh, or single protagonist being kind of the, you know, everyday person does kind of help because it does that contrast of, um, I think what CJ said of uh, I'm trying to my thoughts together um, of the coziness because it is something that anybody could relate to. Then also the contrast to the horror because then you're just a you know, regular everyday, everyday person, slight helplessness with that horror. So I suppose it helps the coziness when character like 
discover some, some, something about themselves or, or overcome something in a small way. Like, sometimes in, in the, the short stories I've read, big difference between co cozy and then horror is honestly the ending. You know, at any point in this short story, I was wondering, is it going to go in, a, in the, a horrible way in which like, things go badly for our protagonist? And in more cases than not, it, it, like, the, the protagonists come out you know, a, step, a, a tiny step ahead in their lives, but you know, still a step ahead. Even if it's just like understanding, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Or maybe I shouldn't take that job. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. It's like one of those things in which if you start a short story, it's going to be, it's only until the end you'll understand if it's the cozy part has come before. Okay, so, sorry, you go to Jay. No, I was just thinking about that. I was trying to remember for the life of me, my partner appeared in another one of these cozy horror things. Angela Blackberry or something like that. It's a series of books that was filmed. Oh, and it's uh, going... Agatha Raisin. Agatha Raisin. It wasn't Angela Blackberry. Becky appears in quite a lot of Angela Raisin episodes on and off. And I was trying to think about the kind of characters who are in there. And, you know, it's the art dealer, the village fate. The, 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 the limited, there's quite a limited number of roles that you get. But the actual central thing in those is the relationships between the characters. Now, if you change that into a game... From a design viewpoint, you can design mechanics to try and make players play as a party and act cohesively. Um, as a story guide, you can try and encourage them to stay together and to pay attention to domestic themes. But ultimately, it comes down to players to make those decisions, not to the story guide or even the mechanics to some extent. So I was trying to think, what is a game that reflects these values i'm sure you'll come back to that in a moment so i'll shut up about that but i was also trying to think what differentiates i mean uh, matrons of mystery is a great game i've played it many times had great fun with it it works really well online with a whiteboard and the way the mechanics are really clever and i thoroughly enjoyed it so you know kudos to sue in that respect my family understand it because it draws from genres they understand but what differentiates most cosy horror from, say, cottagecore D and D, or cottagecore aesthetic? What's the what's the difference that makes something cosy horror and something cottagecore? I don't know. I was trying to answer that in my own head, so I'm going to throw that back to everyone else. I think I might have an example. Um, I don't know if Sleep Away by J Dragon. Is consider, people considered it a cozy horror. Um, it is a role playing game. You play teenage camp counselors, basically trying to keep these little kids from getting into trouble. But the problem is, the trouble is this eldritch horror that's in the woods. So a lot of the conflict really is about the camp counselors, you know, overcoming their teenage, the teenagenessness of being a teenager. But every so often, a scene can activate this eldritch horror that will then cause something to happen so it's a weird balance because like um you know again the the conflict is technically focused on can you keep these kids in line and you know does bob have a can he resolve this crush he has on christy then you know all right well you know suddenly a dismembered dog is left in the middle of the camp what do you do about that and so that it creates this weird contrast um Again, I don't know if the creator calls it a calls it a cozy horror, but I feel like that's kind of close to where, in terms of the game, that could be used as an example. But it reminded me of a discussion I heard some people having uh, about Regency a while ago. I've always, I've never really fully gotten Regency as a setting, but a lot of my friends are big big fans of it, and they were explaining one of the great joys of Regency is there's an eldritch horror behind the door, but you still need to have tea with the vicar. Whatever you do, do not coat your lord, his lordship in butter before ramming him up a chimney. It's, <laughs> it's certainly not in front of the servants. Not that that happened a few minutes ago. <laughs> yes, I was in a different room behaving far more decorously. You were. You were upstairs trying to pull, take off Rosa's corset to pull her out of the chimney before you rescued the small boy who had been um, a, rammed up the chimney by the... Uh, by the by, the sweep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We've been playing the Regency game until about twenty minutes ago, or half an I hour. See, I see. 
So I wonder if there's a bit of an overlap there um, in terms of that the relationship between wanting business as usual to feel like and the the dynamics of relationships and the dynamics of real life trying to continue while horror comes is that the same or is that distinctly different from this idea where the horror sneaks in through the domesticity so let's give you an example of what i think is a cozy horror game that i wrote um is the scenario and then another example from gareth handrahan which is not cozy horror to my mind Anrahan wrote the most horrific game I have ever played. It has, if we were to list all of the content warnings that there should be on it and trigger warnings, there would be nothing left. There would be no room for it. But Gareth Hanrahan wrote this wonderful story called I Can, I can See You. Yeah, I Can See You. Um, it's for Fear Itself, a fairly obscure role-playing game by Pelgrim Press. My partner, full disclosure, is Becky, who supports at Pelgrim Press when she's not appearing in dodgy TV shows. And she um, she sent it to me once to run at a convention. And I'm amazed I got away with it without being banned for life. It begins, Gareth's scenario begins with a bunch of teenagers who have been brought together for an intervention because their friends have stopped eating and has carried out, and very quickly it becomes clear that she's showing all of the signs of a severe schizophrenic psychotic episode now immediately while they're doing the intervention there's also various other characters become involved the horror builds very quickly from there but i mean if you haven't hit enough trigger warnings there already then there's references to suicide self-harm and the whole thing the whole background of it is a typical american suburban home with real teenage you know with teenagers with real teenage problems but those problems are far more intense than you might expect. And it reminded me of an episode of Brookside, which is a British soap opera, or an episode of Coronation Street, or some other British domestic tragedy TV show. But it is, it's profoundly dark. It's, it's certainly a brilliant game. It's a horror game. I've run it many times now. And I think almost anything Gareth writes is worth playing. I mean, he's a brilliant author. He wrote The Pirates of Drinax for Traveller. Um, he moderates on RPG I now know as Myth Holder. And he he's a he's a absolute star of the RPG scene. If you haven't seen his work, do go look up Gareth Hanrahan. My game is about five sisters, the Blenkinsops, who arrive in eighteen twenty seven to take the waters and attend a ball, and maybe the old ones find husbands in Regency Cheltenham. And it's about buying dresses. It's about going away from home and being teenage girls and meeting exciting young men. It's about dealing with family stuff and getting on with your sisters. And yet it is... Sue, is, you've played it, haven't you? Yeah. Is it a horror game? Uh, um, parts of it were horror, horror I think. But I think it was, the, it was the horror intruding on trying to get on with... Uh, living life in the Regency, which is kind of tough enough yeah. as it is. Yeah, it's the the horror in it is the social constraints being placed on you. So the characters can't just go round murder hoboing their way out of the situation when something goes wrong, because they constantly have to maintain respectability, and things tend to build. And every time we run it, it's different. But the characters build themselves into a state of uh, frenzied. Um, horror because they they basically trap themselves they're trapped in their social roles and as soon as they push against those roles that's where the horror lies but they're both games about domesticity but they're both very different I would argue the Blenkinsops game or the last letter of Laura the last love letter of Laura Laurel which we just played are both cosy horror but Can I See You is actually real horror um, I'm not quite sure what term you'd use, but it's one of the most disturbing games I've ever run. So I don't know. That was just my. I gave a couple of examples because they were the only things I could think of. I'll shut yeah. up now again. No, it's your your contributions are valuable. So I'm getting from all of you this very clear idea that it's the horror has to be intrusive. It has to be from a known source, maybe. So it. External sources of horror like Yogg Sothoth turning up and destroying everything, or uh, 
the Meagle turning up and setting something on you, that's not going to be horrifying in a cosy way. This has to be coming from inside the house, if you will, in order for it to be properly cosy. Does that feel... I think it needs to affect you on a, a personal level. So like, it, okay. it could be something like the Mego, but then the, the problem is that they've uh, taken over your maths teacher or something like that. And, and you, you still need to pass just, your A-levels. And your grades are just slipping a little bit. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have another short story example that kind of, kind of fits that definition. Um, so in America... Um, Tom Wiswell is the short story writer that's kind of known for cozy horror. Um, he has a story, uh, it's called That Story Isn't the Story. Um, coincidentally, it's from Uncanny Magazine, which I work for. Um, and the plot of that one is is kind of simple. It's basically a, a person who is, uh, I believe, been a familiar, right? um, and it's broken away from this very abusive relationship. And the focus is all about trying to recover from that and and i suppose the horror the horror of course is trying to recover from abuse but there's the concept of is this is this person's master going to come back and drag them back um and but it's not stated super stated it's not like the the master's just appearing around the corner it's always this constant constant fear which is also again kind of a metaphor for the ptsd trauma of being in an abusive relationship that the being is the person is there in your psyche, but not physically there, but it's still kind of there. And um, the yeah, there's there's no like you know, rich monsters from outer space coming to like destroy everything. It's all about that that uh, tension. I think the, the main character is constantly going through, and it's very quiet. It's very. Um, I mean, I get the abuse and trauma is not cozy. I, I feel, but um, it is about the person trying to heal over over time. So, short story example. Uh, so, can I just ask before I forget, where can we where can we subscribe to or buy Uncanny Magazine? Because that sounds interesting, and it's something we should all know about. Can we add that to the links as well? All right, I will send that off as well. I, we want I mean, to be able I, to Uncanny, yeah, because I've never heard of it till Monty mentioned it. So we, we definitely need to promote that. <laughs> I've been following it for a while, but you know. <laughs> okay. Um, so... Brilliant. Yeah. So it's now in the YouTube chat with all the other links. As you guys send me links, I'm throwing them in the YouTube chat. I'm, I'm all over the technology, the joys of <laughs> loving it. Oh, we've got even more stuff. We've got more links coming for everyone. Um, can I maybe just change direction for a while? Um, what are the don'ts of cozy horror? We spent a lot of time trying to define it, trying to find a definition and discovering that it's a bit complicated. There's some bits that we can kind of agree on and other bits that can kind of go all over all, all over the place. What I'd like to know is what should we avoid? So the first thing that comes to mind, Monty, you were just talking about abuse, trauma. Um, these aspects of humanity where we need to put content warnings on things, these things that are often incredibly close to home for people that are very difficult to write about, that some people want to engage with because it's how they process it, that other people want to go nowhere near. Maybe we could do a little bit of a discussion about dealing with sensitive topics, whether or not they fit into cosy horror, whether or not how they could be fitted into cosy horror. Do you want to go, Sue? Uh, not right now. <laughs> I need to think about that one a bit longer. Okay. So I've been trying to write a story. I'll, I'll go for a moment because I'm good at I like talking a lot, um, even though I've got nothing useful to say here. But I've been trying to write a scenario called Bright Are the Stars at Night. Uh, at the moment, it looks like it's going to revolve around two characters, but possibly one. And it's set in a very ordinary house and all that's happening in the scenario is that fairly early on one of the characters the woman in the, in the scenario the married couple starts to hear snatches of old 1960s pop songs and assumes it's the neighbor's radio but each time the pop songs are asked she's asked how did how do you feel about that what's the emotional 
and we play a snatch of a song. And she goes to try and, and she can never get to the bottom of what's going on. She can never locate where the music's coming from. But eventually she realizes it's all from a very short period, a very short period in the night, like in the early 60s. And the rest of the scenario follows from that. But a lot of the questions in that is to the directed to the player, but in character, I guess. How does that song make you feel? Or how does hearing that music make you feel? Or how does standing in your kitchen with this sense that someone is watching you as you're washing up, you reach for the fairy liquid. But there's this strong feeling. It's not a frightening feeling. It's not a feeling of a predator. You don't think you're about to be stabbed. You just have a feeling there's somebody else there with you. And at times, the feeling is of someone reaching out. It becomes clear something needs to be done about the situation. Now, in the original draft I wrote, there were children involved, and I was told very quickly by the editor I was working for, I won't name him, um, as all he always does whenever I try and do this, you can't have children involved. It makes it too horrible. Okay. But he said, no, it stops being cosy. It stops being a comfortable kind of horror because the characters will just move out because they're worried about their children. And as soon as you introduce children or real family or a family mechanic, you know, and characters start to be invested in the puppy dog or the children, they won't stay. And I said, well, you know, we could just establish at the beginning before we run that nothing bad will happen to the puppy dog. As to the children, well, you know, at the end of the day, they can always have another one. Um, but the editor wouldn't have it. So one of the things I'm going to say is at least one RPG, in fact, possibly two RPG companies so far, have said to me, don't involve families, don't involve familiar concepts. This is, this game gave me the creeps because the scenario, as I was reading it, I began to look at my own house and began to imagine hearing the music and it freaked me out. Because it's just too close to home, and because it's very vaguely stated how, what the what the house looks like. Um, the so the I, I mean, okay, I agree. I I always claim that all editors are idiots, but that's not true at all. Mike Mason at Chaosium is wonderful, but the, I've had trouble with some in the past, and others are great. I'm sure Monty Lynn is lovely as well, CJ. I'm sure Monty's wonderful as well. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've written for Atlas Pelgrain. No, I haven't written for Pelgrain. I've written for Atlas Chaosium and a bunch of other. I've written a lot of role playing game books. I didn't bother to mention them because they're not very interesting. But editors usually will let you get away with stuff. But as soon as you get into cosy horror, they get quite wary about it. So I don't know. What's, what do you think about that? Monty, as an editor, would you be unhappy to run a game on, with children? To run a scenario with children involved? Oh gosh. Well, I mean, I, I, I recommended Sleepaway, which is literally about teenagers trying to protect children right, from right. the elder or in, in the forest, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was a very, when I ran it, it there was a very interesting conversation about like well you know people didn't want to have children in danger i was like well part of this game does have aspects of the children being in danger and the book itself also has this advice that is also very i don't know i found very interesting but also difficult to try to walk that line um you know but you have a game where children are in danger where they're not in danger and I, I think at least in the game i ran um the Acceptance was that we can turn that danger always toward the player characters. In other words, the children are in danger, but there always has to be an option for the player character to jump in front, and prevent like, from this from happening. But then they yeah. could, they could be hurt, and for them, for the players, they felt like, well, you know, I know we're teenagers, but if I dove at the monster to protect the little kid, I feel like that's a good it's a good sacrifice. That's that's a statement about my character doing something brave even if they get killed at least we did something at least we have the agency and the power to do something you know and so i think we we never got a a, a chance to get to that point it was like these were one shots um the book itself doesn't say to go too hard uh, on the horror in a one shot they wanted to be more creepy you know, like yeah. everything in the background but um, I was both dreading and interested to see if we would ever get to that point and see what would happen and how people would feel about it. So um, I don't know if I have a good answer for uh, all these questions. I think it's like, 
it's with games. There's a has to be a lot of conversation in the beginning of like what the stakes are and what can be challenged and how much agency players can have horror game, um, but how much safety can we have if it's cozy? And um, you know, I, I will go back to uh, the befuddlement I have about this whole category <laughs> in the beginning of this talk. So. Bring, because uh, there's a very famous Scottish trope of elves, probably, uh, if any of you have read Fairyland by Scott Dorward, um, yeah. that sort of um, story highlights it. The child is never in danger because it's just the child is not who you think it is. You've you've so the story of fairies is that they'll steal your child and replace your child with a fairy child. You end up raising a fairy child in your home, and that in of itself, because is it is it to do with the fact that we have removed the violence and the gore and the macabre and replaced it with just a creeping worry and itch at the back of your brain when i ran fairyland scott's um graham wormsley gave me a copy at a convention many years ago i think and i ran it um i recently bought it it's now available on drive through i would recommend it i really would it's superb it's about a small scottish village well but, but there's a wood at the back of the house i'm not going to go into details but one of my players andrew in real life has three children including twins and in the game, he decided his character would move into the house and he had his children with him, you know, his character's children. But as a real world father, as he perceived the beat to be a threat to the children and after he'd been to a few of the other locations in the village with two of the other player characters, he completely and utterly lost the plot and tried to burn down the woodland behind the house to, to protect his children. He went out to get an LPG tank to tow it by tractor to drag it through the woods with a bulldozer so he could then spike it and set fire to the woodland. And so he turns Fairyland into the most violent scenario ending I've ever seen. It was positively apocalyptic with his character burning to death in a misguided attempt to save his children from a horror. So, you know, it's always impossible to know how a scenario will go. That's a, it's a great scenario. It's a creepy, delicate scenario. And that doesn't tell you anything. There are no real spoilers there. That doesn't actually tell you anything useful about the scenario, apart from the fact that one of my players was emotionally affected by it and started to talk about how much it meant to him as a father to protect his children. And he asked me never to run another game featuring children. And I said, well, you wrote them into the scenario, not me. So... I mean, you know, it's just a weird experience to someone like me who doesn't have any children because I sacrificed them along. No, sorry, because I, I never had any children. Um, yeah. I just thought of something, actually, which is Doctor Who. It's a British science fiction show. Are you all familiar with it? Yeah. Yeah. So Do Doctor Who is a fairly popular British sci-fi show. Um, and... Yeah, I was chatting to one of my friends about it a while ago. He'd appeared in it, actually, briefly. That's another story. And he said to me, you know, this is... It's, it, it's a, it is a kind of cosy British thing. And is it cosy horror? Interesting. Because I think there are elements of Doctor Who which are very much cosy horror. Especially I the recent, like... recent series, which I, I caught an episode of. <laughs> I feel like Sue's going to have some insight here. Yeah, Especially I'm... as CJ's just broken his entire setup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... I think what we were saying about agency, I think that's quite a, a big thing in Cozy Horror. As, as a protagonist, you've probably, pretty much always got something you can do in, in Cozy Horror. Like, so one game I run a lot is Cult, which is about as uncozy as it gets. And like, Loss of agency is absolutely a thing in that you're going to be rolling to keep it together and failing, and then me as the GM is telling you what happens to you. You've got a bunch of disadvantages. When you fail those, I'll be telling you what happens. Uh, that kind of thing just doesn't come up in cosy horror. It's You're pretty much always in control of your actions, even if you're having to do something you might not necessarily want to, like throw yourself in front of a monster to protect children. And yeah. I think Doctor Who does have a bit of that vibe. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, it's low on violence. You you never, I don't think you ever see blood in Doctor Who. 
And so you, you might do in a, in a cozy horror, but it won't be yours. Hmm. Interesting. So is that one of our avoids if we're going to build into cozy trope, cozy horror tropes? Unlike most scenarios, you kind of have to avoid violence, death, and gore. Well, violence and gore. Yeah, so that you can have gore in there, but it's it's not going to be happening to you. It's it's going to be something that you find. One of my one of my friends wrote a horror show. He wrote several actually, but the one I'm thinking of in particular was quite influential in the 1990s. I very much doubt anybody here will have ever heard of it. Well, Sue might have done. It was called, um, oh, what was it called? The League of Gentlemen. And it's about a bunch of odd characters living in a town called Royston Vasey. Um, my friend so Ruth. Famous, CJ. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, the joke is that me and Reese are friends because I never watch anything he does. He later did Psychoville and he now does Inside <laughs> Number Nine. Um, if you ever want to hear my story of the times we've been ghost hunting together, that's far funnier. But anyway, um, I did an episode, I did a radio show with the League of Gentlemen um, a while back, and it was good fun. But yeah, the League of Gentlemen, I think that there are elements of cosy horror in that. I mean, even if it's just Reese playing tubs and saying, it's a local shop for local people, but it's a kind of domestic British kind of thing. So maybe, again, cosy horror is defined very much by situation, because it's a very black comedy, but it's a very Mm -hmm. domestic comedy. It's almost a... I don't know. Maybe I've gone completely mad. I usually have. So, yeah. Monty, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, Monty, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, does could Cozy have violence and gore? Should it not have violence and gore? Is that part of our tropes? Where does that fit in with the stories you've been reading? Um. Wow, that's a good question. Um. I feel like. <clears throat> I feel like Sue's um, um, statement about having the gore and the violence being kind of like in the background um, feels like it kind of fits. A lot of the the stories I did read um, have the threat of violence or the violence that has occurred, but is in the peripheral vision. You know, it's never kind of front and center. Um, At least again, the ones, the ones that I gravitated to. Um, So um, I don't know if I have very, I have to think about that. I have to think about that a little bit more. Let's let's maybe circle back to it at some point. If anything occurs to you and pops up, we'll get to it. Because I want to kind of move us on now. We've done a lot of our defining. We've kind of built ourselves a box now. I feel like we can all talk about cozy horror and the boundaries of it without too many issues. And I want to talk about gaming. I want to create some games that are cozy horror. I want to... We might find scenarios, but maybe create scenarios. Maybe this is my homebrew. What sort of systems should I be using? Let's start there. What sort of systems should I be using? Can I use Call of Cthulhu? Can I use cults? Does Cthulhu Dark work? What system should I be using? Let's start there. Sue, sell us your game. <laughs> yeah, well, I was actually going to say, I think Call of Cthulhu is a pretty good shout. So partly it's because I've played a bunch of CJ's games. Uh, which have been some of the funniest games of Call of Cthulhu I've ever played. But, uh, also, it's the, the characters in Call of Cthulhu, they tend to be the kind of ordinary people that work well in a, a cosy horror. And well, so obviously you, you can have violence in Call of Cthulhu, mm. but you really don't have to. It, it can just be something peripheral. The, the horror can come from the things you find. Yeah, it's very sweet of you to say nice things about my games. Um, I run them mainly at conventions, don't I? The cozy horror games. So yeah, yeah. I think I think Call of Cthulhu is an excellent choice. Um, obviously, I better mention that Pelgrim Press to a whole range of excellent games that are investigative. But for cozy horror, I quite often fall back to Call of Cthulhu. It's my my favourite. Um, the emotional effects. I think for me, cozy horror is about emotion rather than ideas and as i argued the other day to a bunch of to the panel lovecraft is largely about ideas and about big ideas not lovecraft the person but lovecraft stories have a lot of big ideas in them um you know intelligent dinosaur civilizations um 
ancient vast areas of history what we now call the silurian hypothesis the nation the notion that there might have been technological civilizations in the past stuff like that lovecraft's big on those big ideas but cozy horror to me is all about emotion an emotional scale i'm putting the emotional relationships between the player characters um really at the heart of it so call of cthulhu works fine for me but almost any role-playing game I mean, sure, you could do it with D&D if you wanted to. You could do it with anything. Yeah, I think Regency Cthulhu works particularly well because there is the whole focus on etiquette and reputation as well as dealing with the cosmic horrors. And then Gaslight's coming out soon. Is that going to be... Is that going to work as well or is that going to take Cthulhu in a slightly more pulpy direction? Thoughts? I've got a feeling that's probably going to lead more into the Gothic side of things. I'm not sure what I can say because I'm under NDA from Chaosium. Um, but I think that Gaslight has many, many possibilities. Um, my personal viewpoint is largely towards the societies from, I mean, in real life, I'm a member of the Society for Psychical Research. I run the British Learned Society, ASAP, um, the Association for Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena. You can find us at www.asap.ac.uk. So I deal with hauntings, poltergeists, um, scientific anomalies and UFOs, that kind of thing. Basically, just anything on those lines that you need dealing with academically or that you need a response to, the authorities pass on to us and we have investigative teams. And so recently I've had a dragon sighting um, near a military base in Surrey, which had multiple witnesses in broad daylight and footage. I was assuming it was a um, kite or a drone or something similar, but I was the person who took the call and found a zoologist who told me, who leant forward and spoke to me and said, Chris, you are aware that dragons don't exist, that they're mythical. So I'm talking to a crocodile expert, well, the, the country's leading expert on crocodilia, and I said, yes, yes, I'm, I'm fully aware of that, but people are still seeing it. Um, you know, we need to look at it. So he went off to, to I won't say exactly where it is, but it's in Surrey. <laughs> so he went off and he, there are a team of people following up on it at the moment. Now, it might seem bizarre that in real life people have these experiences, but they do. And somebody has to deal with them and that person happens to be me. As I said, I don't do anything very interesting, but what I do do tends to be... Well, it depends what you regard as interesting. But because my day job involves poltergeists and hauntings and investigations, I'm also a historian of psychical research and have a very strong i have a an entire archive of victorian psychical research journals in my basement as well as the british government's old ufo files you know because who doesn't keep secret ufo files and they're, they're not secret anymore they've been disclosed but you know i've got them all laying around so for that reason um i tend to um just think that gaslight will the, the emphasis might be on investigating mysteries supernatural mysteries queen victoria less the pulpy kind of professor challenger stuff and more the kind of eerie jack the ripper uh foggy streets um country house mysteries handle of Vaskervilles, uh society seances those are the kind of things i'm predicting uh but i have no knowledge of what mike is actually planning for it so ask mike Anyway, sorry, that was an aside. I just thought I'd mention what I do for a living because it's. I guess I should mention it sometime. Yeah, I mean, clearly you're um, an incredibly boring person, as you've mentioned a few times, so it does make sense that you would run something like ISAP. Um, well, somebody has to. You can Google it. I yeah. mean, it's not hard to find, but yeah. Yeah. I'm a, yeah. Well, like my partner, she has a PhD in academic parapsychology um, and wrote her thing, her PhD on the psychology and neurology of apparitional experiences when we were attempting to find ways to cause people to see apparitions. Um, you can find her PhD online and read it. It's a, from a British academic university. But her job is working as support officer for Pelgrane Press. So if you have a customer support query, that's what actually keeps our research going. Uh, on, on her so, yeah, I mean, you know, role so I should... need to hire more parapsychologists is what I say. So in order to fund parapsychological research, I need to send in questions to the people who write Morkbori. 
Or you God. should no, no, no uh, Trail of Cthulhu, Fear Itself, Trail of Cthulhu. Uh, 13th Age. Um, ah, right, okay. Yeah, buy more role-playing game books. Basically, just buy more role-playing game books and psychical research will proceed. And, you know, we might actually have the resources to send people out to look at crashed UFOs and stuff like that. Okay, I'm going to try and pull this back now, back onto messaging, which is talking yeah. about how we run uh how we run cozy horror so we have this understanding that we can use systems that are familiar to us that's really good what sh what should i do to make it feel cozy what should i talk to my players about how should i set the scene sue monty i think start off with something very comforting and familiar it's a, one of my own scenarios. I didn't actually write it as cosy horror. It just kind of turned out that way somehow. Uh, it, it all starts with a group of people going to a country house for a Christmas party. So the, the start of the scenario, it's all things like uh, the, the chauffeur being immensely proud of the Rolls Royce. Uh, and then you get the description of the house with the Christmas tree and the candles. Uh, the owner of the house being very proud of his new electric lighting. And then it's a, a nice meal, brandy and cigars and a game of cards. That was your wonderful M.R. James kind of story for um, for Lou Dark, I take it. Yeah. Yeah, I played that one. That was a wonderful game, really. And it is. It's very much cosy, that kind of lit windows on the snow. And yeah, absolutely beautifully done. Yeah. So it's a matter of atmosphere and tone as well as choices, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So okay, right. I have this. Let's let's maybe start building ourselves a cozy story then. So we've set the atmosphere and tone. It's uh, a let's go with an English manor in the middle of winter. Snow is falling. It's Christmas. You're having the family round. Uh, of course, you're having the family round, and it's a big family. You're all uh, various, slightly older members of the family, and you've made your way to this house. What are we going to do with these people? What sort of story are we going to try and tell to make this interesting from a cozy horror perspective? CG, I feel like you can jump in this one. Harry has just proposed to Ethel. And handed of to course. the room, and Ethel delighted, and they're planning excitedly the wedding. And just at that moment, the twins run downstairs and say, It has Santa come yet? Has Santa come yet? Can we have our presents? You know? So everybody is happy, joyful, the fire's crackling. And at that moment, Monty. <laughs> Uh, this is personal horror now, that putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, wow. Uh, would it be something as small and mundane as like a missing present? Yeah. Ooh. All the presents that are out Ooh, there, yeah. and somebody notices that one, I mean, I mean, if you really want to tug at the heartstrings, it's like Nana's present is missing. And I was going to suggest it's the big present for the youngest child, who is now upset. Too. The yeah. oldest or the youngest. It's like always the, the extreme there, right? So, um, and then I will quickly duck, duck out and hand it over to someone else. <laughs> but maybe maybe mm. then the present was actually Grandpa, who's died recently, Grandpa's old faded pink teddy bear with the button eyes. And the family had decided to give it along with a rather wonderful wooden cart that it was to ride in to the youngest, to Rodney. So, Sue. So where exactly are we going with this now? That's entirely the fun. To tell me a story. We're we're telling cozy stories. Uh, I think Horrifying this is the point stories. Where, where, well, where everyone in the family has to start searching the house to try and find out where this present has got to. Yeah. Maybe there's a bit of disagreement as people are talking about who last saw it and who's been keeping it. Yeah, this is where everyone splits up and spreads out around the house, and uh, that's going to be the point at which the strange things start happening. Uh, uh, maybe someone finds a door that they don't remember being there before. And could I, at the same time as introducing these horror elements, I'm also exploring the personal dynamics and seeing a lot of 
a lot of the horror of close family of the he said she said and the long held grudges and the the what Ethel said to young Barry once and why um, Aunt Ida no longer comes to these things and they can be quite horrible in their own way and they can contrast with the horror. Yeah, plus you've got the extra challenge going on that you're cooking Christmas dinner and everyone's got a job to do. So you need to try and deal with the situation in between getting the potatoes peeled. Yeah, the turkey in at the right time. And of course, this is an English country house, but the servants have all been given the, the weekend off to see their respective families, presumably. So you've also got a family who don't really know how to cook or how to run their own home, but are somewhat isolated by the snow because it's going to snow, isn't it? Yeah. Because otherwise, how can you see the bear's footprints leading off across the field into the village? Bear? Yeah, the teddy bear's footprints where he's walked off in the snow, oh. having climbed out of the box. Yep. Follow him down and he goes to the fish's arms where Grandpa used to sit and drink his pints. Nice. Okay. Yeah, we okay. This this has got a lot of so. This feels familial. It feels homely. It feels like we're exploring family. It feels like we're looking at intergenerational divide. All these words are kind of feeding into it, but we've also got this horror element sitting on top. I, that it feels very cozy to me. Is that's the cozy horror story in some ways? I feel like we're cracking it. This is good. <laughs> Monty, do you want to start us off with a new story? See if we can build another one. Just want to try and build two or three of these. Maybe something set in Montana. Everything mm -hmm. cozy is set in Montana, right? Well, I kind of wonder if we want to challenge ourselves um, and think uh, in a city, though. I don't know if yeah. I 100% agree that it has to be like in a suburb or like a small town. Um, this is me just throwing complications in because I am struggling to think of a good mm -hmm inciting incident so um but i, I don't know if that maybe that i don't know if that's a worthwhile challenge i do feel like you know the stereotype of a city being like cold and distant you know and and, and trouble i feel like is very a frustrating one because it's just as stereotypical as the quiet friendly suburb right and it's and this might be an opportunity to, to challenge that a little bit i i am absolutely going to uh, take that um, and run with that a little bit. So I live on in a block of flats, and I'm one of 12, and we're all cramped together. They're very small flats, but there's lots of them. And I don't know my neighbours at all, not a single one of them, but I can tell you stories about them, what they're like, um, what what their patterns are, when they get up, when they go to bed, who goes to work early, nine to five. Who I know so much about them, even though I don't know them at all, they're strangers to me. And I can imagine a horror story based on really not knowing my neighbours and something really weird happening next door. Can I throw that at you, see what you will build? One of those situations where it's almost like a bottle episode that you and your surrounding neighbours are somehow trapped in an area and kind of having to force to like contend with each other. Or just trapped by knowing each other, which is the basic principle behind two of the most successful TV shows in the last 30 years, Friends and The Big Bang Theory, which are both set in urban city in cities where you've got that community, where you've got that uh, communal living occurring, where you've got people who are sharing, you know, sharing an apartment block, but who become friends. So. And that's what every British soap opera about. It's like a street where people live as if it's the 1950s and everybody knows who their neighbours are. I don't think that's unusual because the street I live in, I know everybody in my street of 22 houses and could tell you their pets' names, their mother's names, and, you know. But that's because I'm a nosy busybody and I like to go around to their houses, invite myself in and eat dinner. And sometimes I even, I, you know, tell them when they come home. You've got to investigate to check to make sure there are no ghosts there. That's what it is. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, everybody gave me their keys shortly after moving in. It's a tradition. You come around and give Chris your keys, and you just hope that he actually, when somebody comes around and claims that they need your keys, you, he gives you the right one. But I did actually one year. I, I confused some friends who came over by going to one neighbor's house to borrow some stuff to cook Christmas dinner and then going to my other neighbor's house and cooking Christmas dinner there. But, um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it freaks people out who don't know me. So. 
but yeah, the city is a wonderful idea. So what would you do, Monty, with the city? Go on. Oh, well, I mean, I think we kind of already answered it in that way, right? The, the stereotype of a city is that people don't know each other and like they're neighbors and they share a wall and if their apartment or flat. And the scenario itself would be the kind of almost weirdly forcing you to get to know your neighbors and understand what's going on because um, you know, everyone's been having these strange nightmares that they've been sharing, right? Um, although every nightmare is slightly different because each person has their particular issue that they've been dealing with, that the nightmare adds this additional layer of, you know, additional thing that's haunting them. Um, that's hmm. what I was thinking, but... I like that, yeah. Okay, I and now I'm going to... How do we make it cozy? Sue, how are we going to make this cozy? See, I'm finding this quite a tough one because I've never lived in an apartment and I've never really lived in a city either. I've pretty much always been in suburbs. So this okay, is let me try. A whole new area me for me to imagine. This one. Uh, let me try. Um, so when we're writing it physically, I think that the style in which we tell the story is going to be different from the moment we step out of the door and when we return back into our own flat. In our own flat, we're going to tell long long sentences, long paragraphs, descriptive words, describing everything, relaxing, taking our time. It's going to be quite a slow, meandering prose. And we're going to feel safe and nothing weird is going to happen inside the apartment. It's only ever going to happen when we leave. And we're going to start dreading leaving. We don't want to step out because every time we're stepping out, we're being forced to contend with the reality of the situation we're in. But when we're inside, we're safe and we're happy. And it's that juxtaposition, that clashing style, both of writing and of um, experiencing, that's going to drive the story. How am I doing? This is me trying to become a cozy writer. I like it, but what about if one of the neighbours has broken their leg and their flat is falling down, their children, they can't look after their children, so it's about forced, people are forced together by something, or a group of addicts have moved into the lobby on the ground floor and are shooting up in the lift and are terrorising the children and are vandalising things. So the community has to make a response. But that response can't be, you know, go down and shoot them because this is a British, this is a modern American city. I assume you can't just shoot people. Um, I don't know. I've never lived in a modern American city. But instead, the community has to come together and is forced. And the strange dreams seem to hint that there's something darker behind it all. So the coziness comes from the infor by, by neighbours looking after one another, by being forced to help one another and enter into a spirit of community, to take food to one another, to go shopping together, to make decisions about whether or not they're going to repair the staircase or paint the staircase. And the home becomes like a doll's house. One thing players love to do in scenarios is build things or create things or design things. That's one thing i found, whether it's designing your dress for a ball or whether it's building a house and filling it with things and describing how you would furnish it. That's one thing that brings players together like few other things do. I wanted to mm -hmm. add a little asterisk, because like, um, a lot of the stories that I was researching also adds like marginalizations as part of the horror that somebody could like encounter. Um, yeah. So like uh, you mentioned like maybe having like addicts like in an apartment, and I would say in a cozy horror, there definitely would not make the addicts the horror they are also suffering from something that's that somebody is, who like, needs to be saved as well yeah that's right, somebody right. Who needs to, to be brought into the community also like you know yeah, exactly. the issues an addict is, is suffering is the same issue as you know apartment the person in apartment 105 who uh, recently lost his wife or something like that exactly yeah. the, yeah. the emotional issues are are shared in some way or at least empathically shared in some way and so. that's the thing, it's the emotional warmth, it's the, you overcome the horror by emotional warmth and joy and reaching out, rather than by isolating it and becoming a prisoner of fear. That's my response to why it's cosy horror. And to add to our, like, you know, apartment complex metaphor is, again, one of the things that sometimes happens in cities is that because the walls are so thin, you accidentally end up hearing or kind of getting involved by your neighbor's life by accident, right? 
there are many times in which like, you know, I've been enjoying a television show and then I hear like an argument and have to go upstairs and go, is everything okay? And like, simply because we're so close to each other that I do have to I end up hearing or being involved in another, another a neighbor's life. And so there's a little bit of a metaphor we can play with that. Like, sure, if you go back into your, your, your own room um, and you have these long sentences and the thing is that outside world is still going to encroach, even if you've got these walls. And now you've got walls as a metaphor between separating you and understanding your neighbor. Thinking very short story as opposed to game. I know yeah. I haven't thought of how to <laughs> gamify this at all, but that's my background. I think well, the joy of this panel is I think that we are allowed to cross that boundary and talk about both. I, Monty, could you help me here? Could you expand a little bit upon you said the short stories you've been reading involve marginalization and you wanted to kind of bring in the idea of the the addicts are helped um assume that i know nothing i know a little bit about this topic but assume that i know nothing can you kind of give me a brief understanding of how we're talking about marginalization in those terms and specifically why it would be wrong to say the drug addicts are the bad guys if you're looking at it through that lens of inclusion. Oh, wow. Um, that is a really big topic. Um, I don't know how to encapsulate that um, in a pithy way. Um, it's, I've noticed a lot of uh, writers who have taken on the concept of marginalizations as like additional horror that a person ends up having to experience, um, bringing a lot of real life stuff, right? Homelessness is a, gr is a great example. Um, mm. I think in some like, you know, older uh, horror stories might have a homeless person be something scary, you know, that the protagonist has to get away from or overcome. But like this homeless person is a person, right? They, they are actually in a position that is even like worse than the protagonist. They do not have a home. They do not have the money and resources to have find a warmth. And in a weird way, that mar marginalization, the, the, the obstacles they're overcoming is an additional horror that they have to overcome. So I think the coziness, I would like to think the coziness adds a little bit of empathy so that the characters that are involved um, understand that like there are various different obstacles in everyone's lives, some more sur sur insurmountable than others, and that the horror isn't putting Blaming the person for those obstacles, I guess, and having them be a source of horror. I think I just talked in a very circular way because I'm still thinking about it. Um, if other people have uh, opinions about this, it'd be great to, to help me here. For me, I think part of the thing about cozy horror is that there is a pleasure and there is a joy in the stories as well as horror. And to find pleasure in a role playing game. For me, is a, is a great joy in itself. You know, it's it's fun to deal with alienation, or horror, and real world misery. But unfortunately, having lived, you know, through multiple bereavements now, uh, brief periods of homelessness, poverty, more breakups than you can shake a stick at, I've been through a lot of things in my life, and at times I have felt very much very 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 much detached from others around me and i've suffered you know depression and ptsd blah 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 in my gaming experience i like to focus on the moments of joy the moments of pleasure and i want something positive and i i think cozy horror is often life affirming it's warm it's egalitarian and rather than raising artificial walls it makes those boundaries thinner it brings down the walls it's the thing that makes me go, walk up to the guy who doesn't like, like me, or the thing that makes me at the local shop and have a conversation with him. It's the thing that makes me try and learn some Polish so I can talk to the immigrants when they moved into our community. It's the thing that makes me reach out to people who are drunk on the street and just say, hey, mate, are you all right? How's it going? You know, it's those things that cause you to reach out. And those are the bits that I like to celebrate in my role-playing games. So maybe, yeah, I think that's exactly what you're saying, isn't it? That there is a that's that's how, that's a response to alienation or a response to um, the horrors of of existence. Uh, cozy horror as as being a particularly joyful 
kind of celebration, not just of the bad, but also of the good together. I don't know. That was just my idea. Do you want to round up that topic? Because it feels like it's a nice one for us to all comment on. Uh, yeah, that's just brought me around to how I'm thinking how so much of well, cosy horror and cosy mysteries tends to be very focused around women. Like, so the game that CJ was talking about earlier, the strange case of Georgina Blenkinsop, the player characters in that are all women. They're all sisters. Obviously, in my own game, Matrons of Mystery, the characters are all women. And and the, the TV shows it's based on, other than Midsummer Murders, most of them are focused around women, and a, a lot of it is warm friendships or family relationships between women. And so the, the horror is coming from completely different areas to the real-world horror that can be being a woman in a patriarchal society. Cool. Thank you so much. Now we're we're we've got about ten minutes left ish of this uh panel and um I know we have a few people watching. If any of you have any particular questions, if you can throw them in the chat, what we'll do is we'll try and get them to and we'll do some quick fire questions for anyone at the end, uh for our lovely panelists here. Uh but with the kind of last 10, 15 minutes maybe it'd be a good time for us to try and summarize what we've figured out so far about what cozy horror is because monty like me i think came into this panel not entirely sure and i think we are a whole we're a big step closer so cj do you want to maybe try and kick us off and just summarize what we've been talking about the last 90 minutes see if we can um make it a bit clearer I just realised that almost all of the games I write predefined characters for, i.e. convention games rather than games I just run, are actually most, the majority of the characters are women. I don't know if that says something about me, but I write games about women and other women getting on and women's relationships with women. Maybe that's because I like cosy horror. Maybe because writing games about men, the male characters tend to... I don't know. I avoid sexual themes in my games. I avoid that kind of thing largely. I don't know why I choose to write about women. Sorry, I, until Sue said it, I'd never really occurred to me, but I've probably written 10 or 15 convention games in the last few years where almost all of the characters are women. How do you notice that, Sue? Yeah. That's one reason that. I like playing your games. I like playing female characters. Even in today's game, half the characters were women, and it would probably it would have been three out of five had we not had an extra player joint. But yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, cozy horror for me is about an emotional warmth, a joyous response to the world. It's about horror, but it's about finding pleasure in horror and the familiar. And it's to me, cozy horror are cozy horror role playing games are games which mingle joy and horror together but the horror is intrinsic to real world stuff now that's an interesting thing because it's often social rather than rather than dealing with someone dying of a disease or dealing with an axe wielding maniac much of the horror comes from the characters trying to maintain their respectability or their role or dealing with vulnerabilities or disadvantages that society places them at um several of my games deal with my own experience of being a young child and moving to a, a lang to a country where they spoke a different language and you know dealing with the resentments which are which you face as an immigrant going into a strange experience a new school but you know so i write a lot of games that deal with social prejudice and confronting that and overcoming that but for me those are the themes of cozy horror Right, uh, Sue, can, do you want to add to that, sum it up? What, what have we learned today? I think uh, cozy horror, it's, it's got to be about ordinary people in a fairly ordinary and familiar situations. And ultimately, they've got to come out of it okay. And finally, Monty, uh, I, I, I'm giving you this final one specifically because I think you came to the panel with a spirit of inquiry. You wanted to learn and think and question. What if, What have you learned about cozy horror from this panel? Um, um, the real difficulty is trying to figure out 
say it in words. Um, I feel like find I find crazy horror a very interesting topic because it's that combination of mm-hmm. uh, understanding and realization that there are some horrific things out there in the real world and trying to find ways to process and understand it and maybe accept it. Um, and or at least not be in denial of it. That's, that's probably better. Um, the coziness, though, is also this this hope, this un- understanding of one's own, I suppose, empathy, and kind of mashing that together in order to see what happens. I'm, I, I'm still thinking of it as a as a writer of short stories. You know, like you know, can we take these like real life diametrically opposite issues of Terrible things out there in the world, and not wanting to give into despair. And let's let's mash them together, see if we can come out with something uh, um, interesting. I suppose that is a very I don't know, so vague. Um, that's just kind of my personal answer. Brilliant. No, this has been great. Thank you, panelists, all so much for your time this evening. Uh, I've been fascinated, um, and I feel like I've learned something. Which uh, so. Regardless of if anyone watched this, you've taught one person something. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, shall we just quickly go back around and uh, if you just tell us where to find you and uh, unless you, CJ, want to send us to somewhere else, what people should look into if they found your talk and your insights fascinating. Uh, CJ, tell us. Um, sorry, my, my last thing I wanted to say very briefly was Perfect. that Ghosts and horrors and hauntings and UFOs and stuff like that are fun and interesting, but I don't think they make great games. Uh, what we need to write more games about are the things that we all share, which is love, friendship, family, community, emotion. And that's what I ended up, although my background is something completely different, that's what I end up writing my games about. So my games are very different to my ghost investigation, but if you want to check that out, www.asap.ac.uk. So. That's it. Yeah. So the uh, the game I was talking about earlier, the uh, the the uh, Christmas in the Winter Manor House, I'm going to be publishing that uh, just as soon as the uh, the artist has done the images for it. So look out for that on Drive Through RPG. Uh, if you search for my name, Sue Savage, you'll find everything that I've authored on there, uh, including my including Matrons of Mystery. So. Yeah, cosy mysteries set in charming English rural villages where old ladies solve crimes. I'm I'm buying it. It's Wonderful. a great game. I own it and played it. Um, I I am very bad at uh, promoting myself, but I kind of want to promote my friends. Uh, this is part of the research I did. It's the anthology of short stories and poems, uh, Cozy Cosmic. It's by Underland Press. You can find it at underlandpress.com. Um, it is basically all my, a lot of my friends are in this anthology and they have their own interpretations of what Cozy is in the wide, broad, uh, you know, friends plus two different definitions. Um, there's some that are hilarious. Uh, there's some that are actually quite scary and I don't know if I would call it Cozy, but, um, and then some of them are quite, you know, thought provoking. Uh, but if you want to find me, um, my website is uh, monty Lynn. Com. Uh, you can find all of my socials over there, um, which I am sometimes probably on too much and not enough, depending on your point of view. So, Brilliant. And I'm John Hedge. I'm the backstage manager of Miskatonic Playhouse, and you can mostly find me on Blue Sky. Just look for John Hedge, or just look for me on any of the discords, or mention alpacas, and I normally find you. Uh, thank you so much for... Uh, joining me today thank you so much for our panelists and that is us finished thank you um please finish your cozy please take your cozy blankets off put your hot chocolates down and uh go get terrified by something